The reason Nathan ended up going to the ranch is because that was his only other option other than jail. He got brought home by the police officers in the middle of the night because he had snuck out of the house and he was now under the influence of drugs and he was a minor and they saw him walking on the street so they had to bring him home. He basically had been caught in an Albertsons where he was using spray bottles or spray cans and um, getting high on them. And so he was caught doing that and arrested. He got into trouble from the earliest babysitters that I remember going to to pick him up or going with his mom to pick him up. He was caught in a closet with um, another boy. They were, you know, messing around, and uh, they got he got thrown out of that babysitter. Basically, Nathan was thrown out of every babysitter and every school that I know of that when he was small, in his early years. He got into trouble, he was hitting kids. And as he grew up, he continued to be like that. He would get into trouble at school, uh, he got into drugs, he got into, you know, other criminal activities. He had, he had difficulties and trouble, and it sort of got worse as time went on when he became a teenager and he got into some really bad habits, hung with some really bad crowds. Different family members for different things have tried to help Nathan over the years when he was growing up. And um, just in terms of like, whether it was money or, you know, buying him things or uh, specifically, I, I went to visit him when he was at the ranch with my grandmother. You know, she took him shopping and spent like $200 on a pair of shoes for him. Like there was definitely like a help, you know, he asked for it, so she wanted to help him, you know. And I gave him things because I wanted to, you know, show that he was loved. Like, I loved him as my cousin, and I wanted to help him. Nathan's mother tried for a long time to help Nathan. And every time he got into trouble, legal trouble, or was arrested or picked up somewhere or vandalizing something, she would sit down with him and talk to him about how he could help how she could help him straighten these things out and get on with his life and it looked like it would be going well and then I'd get another phone call because I was living in New York and he had gone back he was on drugs he was you know arrested he did this or that and she got to the point after they had some kind of altercation that she was afraid for her safety and for her life and she wrote up something for the police and for other people and a lawyer in case something happened to her she feared basically for her life life at that point and didn't want him around her anymore. She was nervous about having Nathan around like he was going to physically harm her or something like that. And he went back to Albuquerque and the only way we found that out was somehow he had gotten in touch with his mom and found out and she found out that he was in Albuquerque and he got hooked up with the, the guys that he w had been taking drugs with before and he ended up overdosing in, in a hospital and obviously was a mess. So then instead of like asking for help coming back, you know, he then went to Los Angeles. Once Nathan got back into drugs heavily, he fell out of touch with all of us. He cut off all communication. We never disowned him. He was living on the streets somewhere. We didn't even know how to get a hold of him. And we would only hear a story here and there. Oh, somebody saw him here, somebody saw him there, but we had no way to reach him. When Nathan ran away, uh, it was very hard on us because we had no way to get in touch with him. We didn't know where he went. We didn't know if he was alive or dead. 